Hi, Mark. Thanks for the interview. Um, I would like to talk to you about an important aspect of jazz improvisation that is not much discussed. So um, I'd like to talk with you about the mental aspect of the jazz improvisation. And the question is, which is <laughs> the mental aspect in jazz? Well, I'll... can you hear me okay? Yeah. So for me, uh, mentally, really to prepare myself for performance, it depends what you're talking about. If you're talking about preparing for performance or if you're just talking about like practicing, they're pretty much the same, you know. But um, mentally, there are just certain things that you have to do to negotiate this music really, you know, at a higher level as far as your language goes. Of course, you first have to know, you first have to know, I gotta find a picture, you first have to know the language tools of jazz improvisation and the rhythms that go with that. And the way to learn that is from listening to the records and just flat out listening to as much as you can, listening to everybody but particularly the masters. And there are some particular masters that you need to learn. Um, I'm sure you'll have some other questions about uh, you know, music and chord changes and things like that. But the mental part of it is, the focus for me is, when it's time to blow a solo or do a performance of a song, I kind of go into a zone. It's a specific zone that I go to where I, my mind is thinking of nothing but really like, I wouldn't say it's a picture of the chord changes, like looking at the chord changes individually, but I do see a picture of the of the um, chord centers of the tune a lot, you know? And um, you do need to know the changes of the tune and all the possible reharmonization possibilities to be able to negotiate, you know, at a high level, I would say. It's important to know all the different little things that we do harmonically to negotiate the millions of two five one progressions and just chord changes in general because when you go to a record date or something they give you a chart you know you you, you have charts that you learn for the record date and you're supposed to get together to perform those charts at the highest possible level by the code that we kind of live by which is just go in and do the very best possible job you can on a performance and you want to do that as a team so in order to do that everyone needs to know the material of course but if everybody pretty much goes into that zone and for me it's a zone mentally where I'm really concentrating on developing through the chord changes saying something but really it's fragments of speech it's very much like the human voice the expression of jazz it's like you're making sentences using the language that we learn the various different harmonic components and rhythmic components. So I kind of just go into this zone where I don't think about anything but what I'm really trying to accomplish at that moment, you know. And if everybody does that together and there's communication and you listen to each other, you know, if you listen to the other musicians twice as much as you listen to yourself, that's a good thing. You know, listen to the others more than, than uh, yourself because you can learn to play off of them converse, conversationally, you know. So those are some of the, the sort of little techniques. But really it's um, the most important aspect of the whole technique of uh, this zone that I'm talking about. It encompasses one really important skill set in the music and that's really what you want to hear which is that you have to think ahead if you have a picture of the chord changes in front of you you have to think ahead always and be kind of playing ahead that way you're forecasting like a weatherman forecasts the weather you think ahead and you can even play ahead of the changes and um you know, we've had many examples of this, of course. Um, I've been running an educational forum since the p pandemic started. And Jerry Brigandi was talking about how his drills of how he plays ahead and how he thinks ahead and things like that. So, I mean, it's, 
it's really a, a skill set in itself of thinking ahead, you know, as you're performing and trying to perform the music. And for me, practice is almost nearly the same as playing the gig these days, you know, you're, because you're practicing this skill set of thinking ahead, negotiating through, and saying something with purpose and spirituality, you know, with love and gratitude through the music, kind of, you know. I look at it that way, to touch the spiritual part of it all, because it's, when it's all, at the end of the road, it's all about spirituality, you know, and love, and how, you, how much you can make people feel with what you play, you know. But from the technical standpoint of just actually coming out and being in, in a good place when you take a solo, being in front of the music is much more important than being in the back. If you're running after those chord changes, you're going to lose. There's no way you win. So I look at it that way, and I teach my students with that method as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So we have just completed three concerts in Italy, um, and one of the things that most impressed me is the absolute control that you have about the music and uh, this is the reason because you dry well also the rhythm well i mean again the the there's certain techniques and certain things that are important but um driving the music with the rhythm with rhythm in general is is uh very important to do you know because that's i mean, that's how it's done with motivic development. If you take a Beethoven symphony, he goes, da 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 He's playing, you know, he's taking the same motive. You can look at Bach, you can look at Beethoven, you can look to the greatest geniuses in all music, and you'll see motivic development and rhythmic development. And that's, you know, everyone used that train, a love supreme, booty do da you know, I mean, it's a, it's just a general part of music that's an important part of it, you know, but, I mean, I'm a drummer, so I think in, I teach rhythmically a lot of the time, it's very important to, uh, especially if you want to challenge yourself rhythmically with phrases and you want to say things with purpose, it's often good to speak in four measure phrases and two measure phrases and echo yourself, quote yourself rhythmically. You do it one time, then you might do it another time, or maybe two, three times, or maybe another time after that. Then you might change the motive and do it a different way. And so, so these kinds of techniques can create a beautiful flow on the language, you know. Um, but you have to use the rhythm. So, you know, even uh, Bill Evans used it a lot, you know. He would go up with the, diminu- with the minor chord outlines and the and the diminished uh, chords, you know, and the dominance, and, and just uh, weave through the greatest standards like Beautiful Love and all these beautiful songs. And uh, much of it is rhythmic, rhythmic-based, you know, the rhythmic concept. So, yes, I use the rhythm to drive the music. Um, but the question, uh, just I have to relook at the question, uh, was about you were impressed with the interplay Yeah, well, I'm a drummer. I studied with Elvin Jones when I was young a bit, and I, and I chased him around for a good long time trying to figure out how to play like him <laughs> and how to swing with that kind of intensity and that kind of passion in the music, you know. Um, just how to get that from Elvin, you know, for a long time. But, of course, he was an over-the-bar line master. I'm a master of of running uh, rhythms over the bar line and, and just uh, you know, swung harder than anybody on the planet. So I just, uh, I just wanted to be like that. So that, that has you know, seeped into my musicianship you know, as overall. When I, when I write, when I play, there's always this motivic development type of a thing where I'm quoting phrases, even in my originals. It's very... You know, we do uh, that song we did, uh, I did it in Europe last week, Miles in Front. 
Ba-do-da. And then I quoted it in another key. You know, this is the essence of much of what happens in, in music in general. You know, re repetition is a huge piece of what attracts the public, what attracts people to music. Um, I believe that, you know. And, and I'm looking to reach people who don't, who aren't, I mean, I'm looking to reach people who don't even know anything about music. Those are the people who buy the music, yeah. you know. Uh, I, I feel it's important, you know, and an important aspect of it. But, yeah, the rhythm, you know, using the rhythm to drive the line. And, uh, you know, just be, when I turn that switch on to play, it's, you have to think of it like you're running for your life. If somebody was chasing you with a gun <laughs> to hurt you, you might run as fast as you could to get away. You know, you have to turn, when you turn that switch on, everything has to go to the very highest level you can make it to make the music work the best, whatever it is. And, and that requires relaxation, being totally relaxed, being right in touch technically with what you're doing, you know, right, right on, on the thing technically. And, and then the framework of the piece of music that you're playing you know the form of it has to be always in your head and you have to be moving through that form thinking ahead but when that switch goes on it's everything you have with your whole heart full of love and gratitude for being alive to play this music because I consider it a real gift to play this music to be able to escape into a piece of music at the piano, you understand, or at the vibraphone, or to play drums with a group of people. I mean, this is a sacred ground for me, so it's, uh, it's important to give your highest level, which means you have to be totally prepared. The thought of not coming to a concert prepared is unconscious to me. I can't even understand that. I experience it sometimes with musicians on the road where they come unprepared to the concert. They haven't listened to the music. And I don't like that. It's disrespectful to the music. You know, it happens. Switch on is a, always a concept about the mind. Yes. Home. So your body, when, you, when the body is tired, but the mind, <laughs> no. <laughs> you need to switch on the mind. <laughs> the mind, it's always about switching on your mind. Yeah, everything. Because the whole application of the music is in your mind. It's just your mind is controlling your body motions, and your body motions have to be refined on whatever instrument you're playing. The body motions, the motions of my my technique on the piano, you know, my technique on the vibraphone or on the drum set. It ha your, your techniques have to be refined to a point that you can not think about that, the actual execution physically, you know. Uh, I, when I pick up a pair of vibraphone mallets like the other night, I was playing piano, then they asked me to play vibes. I go up onto the vibe. It's a big change technically. I'm playing piano for f four tunes, three tunes, four tunes, and then th they want to hear me play vibes, you know. So there's a vibraphone there. So, I mean, I can't escape it somehow sometimes, you know, because I have like 16 CDs as a vibraphone leader. So it's hard to escape uh, the little box that sometimes people might want to put you into. But the bottom line is it's a different technique, and I love both of them. I love both instruments, so I play both instruments. But it's a different technique on the vibraphone physically, you know, than on the piano. So it's a big, it's a slight adjustment, but for me that was no adjustment. I just picked the mallets up and, and the adjust, it's all the same in my head as it would have been at the piano. It's the same. Switch on. Yeah. Time to express yourself on this other instrument, so that's all. And the oh, keyboard yeah. is the same. The language is the same. Sometimes the language comes out different on different instruments because of the way the instrument's laid out, but the language is the same, the keyboard is the same. 
the switch on is the same because that comes from the heart. It's all about commitment, commitment to the music. It's about committing to it, you know, and, uh, and, and thinking ahead is a big part of that switch on. Thinking ahead, being in front of the music, being in front. It's, you know, you, you always want to be in the front and you want to be anticipating the music, not, not the chord hits and then you play something. The as far as the control of harmony, as far as the refer, referring back to your other question, absolute control of harmony, and the reason the reason I have control of the harmony, okay, the deepest reason I have control of the harmony, throughout those solos that you heard in Rome, right, last week. The deepest reason is because I'm thinking ahead, because I'm thinking ahead, and I'm using the rhythm to drive through it. Okay, but I'm always anticipating to create any given line, chordal shape, motion, anything at all. I'm always anticipating the music. You know, it's like a drummer. You're playing a drum, you're playing with a big band and there's a hit on after the fourth measure you have a hit. Okay, on the end of one, on the fifth measure. You're playing some time, you're grooving, right? But you have to look ahead at what's coming at you. If you see in the fifth measure that you have to have to hit the end of one, then there's any way, number of ways that the drummer might get to that place with a fill, you know, with something to fill fill into that hit. You understand? There's any number of ways a drummer might do that. So he 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 has to think ahead as to what he wants to do. He's going three, two, three, four, jab, bash, that that thing to get out. Ba, 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 ba. You know, I mean, there's a lot of thought process, but you have to be in front of it, thinking ahead, or otherwise it's too late. To, and thinking ahead always gives you more chance to make better decisions. So you try to slow the music down, simplify things, so you can make better decisions. How can you use uh, the material, some materials like, uh, is naturally or you have uh, something like a library in your mind and uh, you know what are you going to use? Um, I basically never, I, I really never know you what know, I'm going to use. Or not, <laughs> you know. I, I never know what I'm using, but a library in your mind is a good um, way of describing this. It's a very, very, uh, very thoughtful way of describing um this you know technique of creating lines and creating solos you know creating language um yeah i would say there's a library of elements you know, there's a library of different elements different scales different chordal shapes as you know um i i have i teach a lot and i have s some very specific drills for enlarging and lengthening and enlarging the palette of language that you use when you improvise. And sometimes it's this scale drill, I believe in learning to extend across mm -hmm. your instrument through changes. And I have some very specific drills that speak of that in using chord outlines and the ver chord outlines and scale drill, two different types of drill using many different possibilities because on the dominant chords there are many possibilities to use and I teach a specific method on how to enlarge all of that but when you use rhythm to drive all of this material it becomes a you become like a, a, a I don't know how you can explain it you're just composing in real time yeah. you're self composing in real time you know what I mean you're creating a shape, a shape of a solo. Um, you know, visualizing the chords. You talked about visualizing the chords. Yeah, you have to know the chords. You have to know them, and you have to be able to make all the chords. Because it's easy to subtract chords. It's easy to not make some chords. That's easy. But it's it's the harder challenge, of course, would be to make all the all the changes of the tune, and that doesn't mean play twenty four seven. But you have to know them all, and what's going on. I mean, you, everybody has to be on the same page, so to speak, 
and then you can speak together and have an awful lot of fun, okay, doing it. Uh, you know, uh, a lot has to do, uh, it's been said of some of my compositions that the way I set up the changes, the chord changes on a particular song <coughs> is sort of enabling for musicians because it makes it easy to play because I believe in, I, I use a lot of symmetry, you know, symmetrical, symmetrical stuff. Uh, where I'm quoting four measure phrases a lot, and that's done an awful lot in music, as I said before. Um, but I use symmetrical forms a lot of the times, and they're very easy to digest. And what has been said by many of my colleagues is that the tunes are f flat out fun to play, you know? And that means more to me than anything for, you know, Vincent Herring or Joe Magnarelli to say something to me about that and, and say it in that way and say it they're, they're, your tunes are, are fun to play you know that that's great because you want to you know reach people and make them appreciate what you have to offer you know yeah of course so um you are talking about some um business music the business jazz music the business what mean a business for you in music? I know that you have a label, you produce a, a record, and a, you have a book, uh, Poetic Language of the Skills of the Poetic Language of the Jazz Improvisation is your book. So you are a good businessman. <laughs> Can you suggest uh, something about it? Well, um... You know, the business, I mean, I was thrown into it. I mean, I had no choice. You don't have a choice but to learn about about how to handle yourself or handle the business if you want to live as a musician full time. I mean, I, I was, you know, young. I went to, I was into music very young and I went to college for music. And when I was in my, you know, third year of college, I started you know, substituting on Broadway as a percussionist and doing uh, freelance gigs, you know, studio work for many different composers. Okay, and I built that up over the years and continu continued to do that type of work. And I think one of the good, important parts of the business management is that if you want to really survive as a musician and have, it depends how you want to live. You know, you always have to decide how you want to live, you know. But if you want to survive and have, have you know, what they call mom, dad, and apple pie, you know, in our country, in America, we call that like having two, a couple of kids, a house, you know, a house, a few kids, a few children, and, and a nice life, then you have to decide how you want to live. I didn't want to, I just wanted to play good music. My goal always was to play high-level music with good musicians. Now, that can happen in a lot of different areas in music. I mean, let's face it. There's high-level classical music. There's high-level uh, Broadway uh, music and, uh, there's, and, and shows. And there's high-level studio work, even in the silliest little TV commercial. It's played at a high level, and some of the greatest musicians of all time have been on all those commercials all the way through, you know. Um, you can go back to the 60s and look at some of the American TV shows and, you know, some of those horn sections were full of Jimmy Heath, Benny Golson, Frank Foster, you know. That generation of players were playing studio work to make money. So I just did everything I could to increase the freelance aspect of my life because I didn't want to do a steady orchestra job full time yeah. and commit to standing in the back of the orchestra always. I was a jazz musician before I went to college, so I wanted to play jazz. I really, it was always my love. The, the jazz improvisation, and learn, the chord changes, the, the rhythms, the, the musicians, my heroes, you know, that I, that I have uh, to this day look up to, you know. So I always wanted to do that. So I just used a classical conservatory to teach me how to play music at a high level, technically, reading-wise, improving reading, technique, and sound. 
and phrasing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the aspects of the mental aspect of the music is to stay very relaxed. If you stay very relaxed, then you can phrase out the music better. You can phrase better in small bits, you know, and say more with greater purpose in your solos, you know. So that switch going on encompasses many things that have to happen to make it all go well, you know. And, but, but it is a zone. It is one place sort of like at the third eye that I go, and I can just close my eyes and go there. And it's, it's a happy place, you know. It's a place that I love to be, you know. So um, that's the blessing of, of the music. I, uh, but from the business standpoint, as far as managing my business, it's a very difficult business. I, I One thing that I did uh, many years ago to, to get myself kind of going, because I, I had stopped recording for many years when I was busy making money for my family through freelancing a lot and touring with other artists and things like this. And, um, you know, I, I was always writing tunes. I was always writing tunes. But I went back to recording in like 2003 after about five years of no, no recording at all for, I mean, my own music. And, um, you know, I was going to do, I was going to try and get this r recording I did out on a record label. But some, a friend of mine in the business said, you don't want to do that. Just start your own label and put it out yourself and, and and I got eventually hooked up with a distribution deal a good distribution deal and I start I had you know I had already the uh, corporation set up for this company Miles High Records and uh, you know after uh, 20 year 20 18 years of having this label I have about 37 releases some are mine they're not all mine there's, obviously there's there's uh, many uh, from other artists because uh, many people wanted to put their records out. It's not a big money maker, you know, it doesn't make a lot of money. You have to get lucky, you know. Certain things happened to me recently that were just sort of luck. A Spotify hit, uh, a pop tune in Asia that was a hit. Those are kind of like, just kind of luck. But I did write this stuff, and the writing, you know, the writing, if you write your tunes, you're going to accumulate a lot of tunes into your publishing catalog. And you never know what can happen is the reality of it, you know. So if you can keep recording all the music, you end up generating income like that through the business. Now, as far as getting gigs and launching those records, those 16 CDs and making, backing them up, I started out many, many years ago trying to figure out how am I going to take a group to, to Europe? How am I going to be able to take... I had a record that was a hit here in the States. It was like in the top 10 on the radio for 15 weeks but I had to figure out how to get the group overseas because you know you, you need to get away from New York in order to make money in jazz you can't just play all your gigs in New York if you want to be a jazz player all the time you have to bring the music to the world the world's not going to come to see you in New York you have to bring, I mean everybody so you have to go out and and, and tour and do that so, I started relying on this resource that everybody can rely on, which is called the European Jazz Network. I think it was ejn.net or .org. And you, they list there every festival, every club, every jazz society, every jazz school, uh, jazz festivals, yeah. all over Europe. And you just need to go on there. And what I did was I set, started sending emails to all of them and then i would follow it with a call so you send an email and then you follow it a week later with a call did you get my email because skype once skype and facetime took in took play in, in the world it enabled you to call across the world very cheaply with skype i used to pay ten dollars a minute you know when i was in my 20s you know now it's uh, to call Europe now it's uh, it's it's two cents a minute you know to to call anywhere in Europe so it's very reasonable so uh, I I would I would send an email with a with a MP3 and a proposal for gigs especially I started hitting agents you know managers people who ma managed they were listed also there at the European Jazz Network and eventually uh, 
one, uh, uh, you know, uh, an agent sort of took me on and uh, started booking me. Booked me a tour with Lenny White, booked me a tour with uh, Adam Nussbaum, both tours with Bob Franceschini playing saxophone and myself. And we played originals. We had a band called Project Them. And then, uh, you know, and then eventually I moved on to uh, some other agents as well, you know. Uh, you kind of build it up, and then now I, I begin to occasionally have a tour, you know, tours in Europe and, and Asia where I can go over. Of course, that was pre-pandemic, but uh, I very much enjoyed being in Europe last week for the first time in, uh, in a, year. a year and a half, two years almost, you know. So. But the business aspect, you just have to uh, know when to say no when it's not right for you. And you have to be very aggressive and create something. You have to create things to make them happen. You know, the pandemic hit. I wasn't doing anything like everyone else. We were all sitting in our homes. And I started a Zoom educational uh, workshop that happened on Saturdays. And it's also going to restart in, in a few weeks. But I took a break for a month. But I did it for 40 weeks in a row. And each week I had a different guest. And the guest list is ridiculous. It's got everybody. Everyone from Kenny Washington to Jerry Berganzi to Bill Sharlap to Mike Ladon, Vince Herring, uh, Bob Franceschini, all kinds of really amazing musicians that came as a guest. And they made some money from it, and I was able to make a little bit of money from it. And it was something to do that was really great in the pandemic, but it turned into a a slight business thing because a couple of students from the, a couple of students from the workshop ended up studying privately with me so all these things add into your business you know and uh you just have to uh know what your worth is and uh and run with it and and try and these days it's all about instagram profiles facebook profiles you know but it's always asking the mental of your mental approach <laughs> it's all a result of the mental approach yes it, it becomes a result of that but the 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 mental approach to the music is is economics you know it's like economical yeah. you have to play the music with economics you don't want to work too hard if you know you know if you're a vibes player you don't want to be like every note's like this you want to do like this and be closer so you can be economical with your energy, you know, not spend so much, not pay. You never want to pay too much for that C major scale. You don't want to pay a lot. You want to pay very little. So you learn ways to phrase out and be relaxed. That's part of the zone also. That's part of the zone I'm referring to. So, I mean, it's a culmination of things. With the business, it's the same way. You have to be, you have to be economical and smart with it. That's all you know so pretty cool yeah man i sure enjoyed playing in rome it was great yeah it was great <laughs> you know a few is that enough you got any more questions no i'm i'm you impressed me also when you're talking about the simple simplify 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 everything simplifies uh, for me is a uh, I fixed in my mind, so this, <laughs> this works. Yes, simplification is important. I mean, if you're, if you, but really for practicing, the most important thing is to simplify, but focus on one element at a time. Yeah. Through the, through the chord changes. If you can do that, then it's easily, it's easy to shuffle the elements and juggle like a juggler the elements. But you need to take one at a time and be able to work it through because when you solo you want to develop so you want to be able to take the same motif and repeat it several times different ways and the jazz musicians mentality if you have one two three five and you're trying to work one two three five as a motive mm -hmm. through the chord changes the jazz musicians ment mentality is to change that right away to five two three one or one three two five or some other type of combination of those four numbers you understand the jazz musicians mentality is like that so once you learn to focus on one element at a time like that it's easy to juggle them and create language 
and create your own voice, which is ultimately what you want to do, you know. So, yeah. It's okay, man. Cool, man. So, uh, it was a pleasure to talk with you, and uh, probably this is the first, and uh, we can talk another one session with you on speaking about something. Something else. Or something else, yeah. And... Uh, yeah, well, it was a pleasure to be in Rome and pleasure to be treated so nicely and to play with you and everybody else. So thanks a lot. Okay, man. Thank you. We'll Keep talk. See you next time.